the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's a great joy to be with all of you. So as is our custom, we like to start off always by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many wonderful titles. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. So let's uh, turn to Mary and say the prayer that she loves most. The prayer that she loves most is the is the Hail Mary. Sometimes known as the angelic salutation. So let's say the prayer to Mary begging for her presence among us, that she would pray with us and to pray for us. As we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I'd like to pray also to our spiritual director. What a privilege it is for us to have as our spiritual director, we have God himself. We have the, the Holy Spirit to be our spiritual director. What a great blessing and privilege that is. So let's turn to our spiritual director and ask our spiritual director to help us. And ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light. Because the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the Holy Spirit is the gift of gifts, the Holy Spirit is the sweet guest of the soul, the Holy Spirit is the interior master, and many other beautiful titles. So let's pray together that the Holy Spirit will give us a lot of light as well as the fire of divine more fire of divine love to burn within our hearts. As we say. Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And they shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, 
and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. Our Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. St. Terebius of Mongreco, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. So I'd like to welcome you once again to our Perseverance family and I will be praying for all of you and your intentions and the greatest of all prayers. And the greatest of all prayers is the Holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's right, there's no greater prayer than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to place all of you on the altar. When I offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass today. By far the greatest of all prayers is when we or for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The fruits of Calvary are applied to every Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So these will be my intentions. First, I first I'd like to pray for all of us that we would make a real effort to be open to the Holy Spirit. That's right. That we'd all be open to the Holy Spirit. And we can say this prayer during the course of the day. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Then, <clears throat> the next intention I'd like to offer would be the following. I'd like to pray for your families. <laughs> Excuse me. Many of you have family intentions. Those who have work, some that are sick, others that are dying. I like to pray especially for those who have maybe walked away from the church that they would come back. It's really never too late that they would come back and encounter their true love in God himself. My last intention <laughs> Excuse me. I like to pray for those who are those who are dying today. That's right, those who will be passing from this life to the next. That they would entrust themselves to God's infinite mercy. So we are, we're a 
family, perseverance family. And notice we always start off the day by praying at length. And this is a very important part of our perseverance family. I pray with you and then I place all of your intentions on the altar. Because there's no greater prayer in the world than the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So let's uh, let's move into our readings. So keep up your prayers. Some of you are starting novenas. We all have some family member that's that's uh, not walking the way we'd want them to walk. So let's um, let's enter into our conversation and it's a brief. I'd like to give you a brief catechesis at the beginning. Of our talk. The brief catechesis. For today is I'd like to just take one phrase from the Our Father, and that is, give us this day our daily bread. When we pray that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, there are seven intentions, and we say, give us this day our daily bread. We say, give us this day our daily bread. There are many interpretations that we can take from this. One interpretation would be, we're asking for physical health, that God would give us physical health, so that we can work, and we can provide for ourselves and our family, that we'll be able to provide food, clothing, and shelter for our family. The second interpretation of give us this day our daily bread, we go from our body to our minds. That's right. That we should have a real hunger for the word of God in our minds. Jesus responded to the devil. This was the first Sunday of Lent. The devil tried to tempt Jesus into turning stones into bread. And Jesus said to Satan and to us that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth for the, from the mouth of God. Jesus is saying we have to nourish ourselves by eating, but the mind is more noble than the stomach. The purpose of the stomach is to digest, digest food, whereas the purpose of the mind is to absorb the truth, and the truth will set us free because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. In the third interpretation of give us this day our daily bread, can be interpreted in a parallel sense to John chapter 6, which is the bread of life discourse. Our Lord Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And I will lay, raise him up on the last day. Your forefathers 
ate the manna in the desert, but they died. Do not seek the perishable bread, perishable bread, but seek the bread that gives life. So that's my brief catechesis, my friends, on the Our Father. When we say, give us this day our daily bread, we, we pray for health. So that what we talked about yesterday, we talked about work, that we'll be able to work, work out our salvation in fear and trembling, but also that we would work so that we can provide for our families. And we'll pray for those who are looking for work, that through St. Joseph they'll find work. And give us this day our daily bread. The spiritual interpretation is, the spiritual interpretation is, the bread of life present in Holy Communion. May we hunger and thirst for the bread of life. And the promise, the promise that our Lord gives to us for those who nourish themselves on the bread of life is eternal life. Jesus says it unequivocally. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day. So that being said, I would like to enter into the first reading today of the Word of God. And we go back to the book of Exodus in the Bible. Go back to Exodus. In the book of Exodus, we, we find Moses. Moses, the leader of the chosen people. He leads them out of the slavery to the Egyptians. Then they cross through the Red Sea on dry land. Then they're heading toward the promised land. Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Seen says that it took them 40 years to cross the desert. It could have been 40 days. Point to the fact that they were zigzagging. They were going frontward and backwards, very symbolic of our lives. How often have we taken a, a crooked path? How often have we gone north when we should have gone south? How often we've gone down, we should be going up. I think it's a real symbol for us. A real symbol for us. And we should pray for the grace to follow Christ in his path and not to deviate from the right to the left. So, the re first reading today, taken from Exodus chapter 32, 7 to 14, is that Moses now, Moses leaves the people and he climbs up the mountain. And this is a very symbolic passage because he's going to spend 40 days there. We have a Lenten journey of 40 days. We have a Lenten journey of 40 days. He's up on the mountain so that he can talk to God, but also that God wants to give to Moses the tablets of the law, we call them the Ten Commandments. 
Another interpretation of the Ten Commandments would be Decalogue. Decalogos. Deca means ten. Logos means word. The ten words that God addresses to all of us through Moses. But what happens is the following. Moses is delaying. For a long time on the mountaintop and the people could be, become very impatient so they turned to Aaron who is the older brother of Moses they want Aaron to build for them an idol which would be a golden calf so Moses tells them to give their golden rings and their golden objects, which they do. Then Aaron puts it into a type of furnace and he melts the gold. Then he forms the gold into a golden calf. And the, he elevates the golden calf and the people are bowing down before the golden calf. They're worshipping the golden calf. They're dancing, they're eating, they're partying. So they're practicing idolatry. So what does God do? God tells Moses to go down and to see what the people are doing. So Moses goes down and the people are adoring this golden calf. Now God says to Moses that he will, God is very angry. God is very angry. So God says to Moses that he would like to destroy the people. He will destroy the people because of their disobedience, because of their practice of idolatry. Because of their disobedience, because of their practice of idolatry. But Moses intervenes on the part of the people. And he speaks to God about his promise that he promised to make them as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the sands, the grains of sand on the seashore. And Moses reminds God of the patriarchs that God loved very much, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the covenant that God made to his people through them. So what we have here is that God listens very attentively to Moses. And because of this intervention, the anger of God is placated. God is appeased. His anger is assuaged because of the intervention of Moses. The intervention of Moses. Moses is the representative of God on earth. Now, we see the power of Moses' presence. We see the power of his prayers. 
we see Moses' deep relationship with God. We see his power of intercession. We see Moses is pleading for the people. And God changes his mind because of Moses. You see, my friends, the power of prayer of a holy man. You can read in James chapter 5, says that the power of prayer of a holy man is very powerful before God himself. James chapter 5 points out Elijah. During the time of Elijah, there was no rain. And Elijah prayed, and the rain poured down. And then when the rain was coming down so hard that Elijah prayed, and the rain stopped. So it was through the prayers of the holy prophet Elijah that even the weather condition was changed. My friends, the power of of the prayer of a holy person. We've talked, we've talked about St. Faustina Kowalska. And I mentioned, I was talking about hell the other day and I told you to read 741 and that seemed to impress a lot of you, especially Bev Flores, that that really moved her, that long number on the different pains or sufferings of those who uh, who go to hell. We read in the Diary of Saint Faustine also that it the con the weather condition was bad, and Faustina prayed, and God prevented the storm from descending on Poland where she was. And there's another passage in the diary where God is about to vent his anger upon Poland. Then because of one person, and that is St. Faustina Kowalska, God decides not to chastise Poland. God decides to not to chastise Poland. My friends, I'd like to make a, a an application. I'd like to make an application of Moses, the people adoring the golden calf, then practicing idolatry. And God's listening to Moses and changing his mind not to destroy the Israelites in the desert. I'd like to apply this to you people, as well as to myself. I'm sure what I'm going to say is the truth, that many of you, many of you live uh, in a family situation where you have family members, perhaps in your own home or blood relatives or close friends or colleagues or children or grandchildren 
in which these individuals are are not adoring the true God. They're not adoring the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're not paying homage and worship to the Eucharistic Lord. They're not praying the way they should be praying. They're not listening to the voice of God, but they're listening to the world and sometimes even to the devil. I think all of you can, all of you can identify with what I'm saying and what happened to Moses. So in a certain sense, all of you, all of you, all of you are called to be a modern Moses. That's right. So am I. You're all called to be a modern Moses. In which you want to go before God, intervene before the face of God, and you want to beg God with supplications, with tears, with cries, with petitions, that God would have mercy. All of us are called to be a modern Moses. I'd like to even go beyond the family in this sense. You and our Perseverance family, we have a very, very special family that's together right now. We're, we're all united in the love of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, in the bonds of the church. We're all united in the love of the Lord. But we know that we live in what is called neo-paganism. We live in a paganistic society that is pushing God out. And you know that, and so do I. So let's become a Moses today. Let's all try to become a Moses today. Moses wasn't perfect. Earlier on, he killed a man. <clears throat> Moses had his ups and downs, but God loved Moses very much. He loves you very much too. God is waiting for you to intercede and to pray for many people all throughout the world. California, Taiwan, New York. We have some that are listening from the Philippines. Many people are tuning into our family conversation. You're called to be the modern Moses. You're called to be the modern Moses. So let's do this as a family. Some from Canada, some from New York, from all over the world. Let's place these intentions on the altar because Moses lifting up his arms is symbolic of the priest lifting up his arms. And the priest lifting up his arms is symbolic of Jesus' arms on the cross, offering himself to God the Father as a sacrifice for the whole world. Let's pray for the seven plus billion people in the world. The 
seven plus billion people of the world. That they will be saved. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and the whole world. We are called to be the modern Moses. Let's pray for our countries. Let's pray for Canada. Let's pray for the Philippines. Let's pray for Taiwan. Let's pray for our, the United States. Let's pray for Indian Africa. We've got people that tune in from from other continents. We really believe, as uh, many of you are, are saying now, that some are from Michigan, where I was born in Michigan, all over the country. So let's lift up our hands, lift up, lift up our hearts. with Moses, with Jesus on the cross. I think we should never forget, my friends, this connection. Every time the Catholic priest Every time the, the, the Catholic priest celebrates the holy sacrifice of the Mass, if he's in front of 500 people or even celebrating a private Mass, then that Mass has infinite value. that Mass has infinite value. Because when I celebrate the Mass and I lift up my arms and I lift up the host, I lift up the chalice, what is happening is we go back to Calvary 2,000 years ago. And what happened at Calvary 2,000 years ago in which Jesus was crucified and his blood was being separated from his body. This is called the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. This is called the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. It was Jesus is shedding his blood and he's lifting up himself to the Eternal Father. All the fruits, all the fruits of the holy sacrifice, uh, the, all the fruits of Calvary become present in every sacrifice of the Mass. So we can offer this for our country and the state in which we live because our persevering families really spread throughout the whole world. Thanks be to God. And to pray also for the church like Moses. He was the head of the people. We should pray. We should pray for the Catholic Church. As always, the church has always gone through tough times. As always, the church has gone through tough times. And today the church is going through a tough time. Someone like the vision of John Bosco of the ship in the storm, storm in the sea. He's being 
the ship is surrounded by attacking boats. That's the church today. Let's lift up our, our hands and our prayers for the Holy Father. Let's pray for the bishops in the church. Let's pray for the priests of the church. Let's pray for the deacons of the church. Let's pray for the seminarians in the church. Let's pray for vocations in the church. Because the harvest is rich, but the labors are few. And let's pray, let's pray in a special way. Let's pray in a special way for what is called the domestic church. And the domestic church, my friends, the domestic church, my friends, is the family itself. Pray for the family. So we see, we see, my friends, in this first reading, The person of Moses, the fickleness and frailty of the people, they're falling e easily into idolatry. The power of the intervention of Moses himself. And the people are saved through Moses. May we exercise our own Moses complex in our own lives. You are called to be a modern Moses. You are called to be the modern Moses today. So let us exercise our role of Moses by intervening for the many people that we know that have walked away from God. It's really never too late. Really never too late. You are called to be the modern Moses. You are called to be the modern Moses. And for that reason, the church, the church invites us To look up to the sky and you see the beautiful stars in the firmament of heaven. A couple of days ago I was talking about the Santoro, which would be the church liturgical cycle related to the calendar of saints. The calendar of saints. How wonderful it is to belong to the church, the church suffering, the church militant, and the church triumphant. Twenty third of March the church celebrates a very interesting saint. I think that we see this saint is like 
was like a, a Moses in his time. We're all called to be a Moses in our own time and place. Lifting up our hands in prayer, especially for our loved ones, for our family members. Saint that the church celebrates today, his name is Saint Terribius of Mogro Vejo was born in 1536 and died 1606. He was born in Spain. He was highly educated. He came from a wealthy family. He had a couple of degrees in law. He was helping in the Inquisition in Granada, Spain. And see how God works. This is this this was the Moses, this was the Moses of Latin America. The first bishop of Lima, Peru died. So the Holy Father recognized that the biggest diocese in in Peru, Lima, Peru, died. So the Holy Father called Terebius to go there and to take over that position. Terebius was not even a priest yet. He objected he didn't feel worthy to carry out that mission. But he obeyed the Pope. So he was ordained a priest, then consecrated a bishop. Then he was sent to the country of Peru. to take over the huge diocese of Lima, Peru. Upon arriving, he didn't waste time. He got to know the people. There are many Indians there. They're being taken advantage of. He learned the language of the Indians wrote a catechism for them. And he was on the move. So, think about this. His diocese was, was close to what I heard, about 25,000 square miles. Think, think about that. 25,000 square miles would be his diocese. So for his, one of his first, one of his first traveling missions took him seven years, think about that, seven years to visit all of the parishes in the diocese of Lima, Peru. And he traveled basically by himself through unmapped regions. You didn't have a map or Googling back then, nor a Thomas Guide. He was a courageous man because he had to face wild animals, tropical diseases, and obviously he couldn't stop at a McDonald's or a in and out. There was no in and no out. 
nor a Taco Bell. So at times he would be he would be without food and drink for two to three days at a time, had no place to sleep. What a what an incredible spirit of sacrifice and love that he had for the people. And he had a great love for the Indian people. He was horrified that the way the way they lived. Thousand of these uneducated people. Even though they were baptized, they had little understanding of the faith. So there was there was no no books in their language to learn the basics of catechism. There was no priests. And the Spanish conquerors had very interesting, very little interest in these poor Indians. So given that he was the head of the bishops there, he, he called a council. He called the council of bishops. And he said, you know, what we have to do is we have to communicate with these people, so we're going to have to write a catechism in their own language. They set up classes for the poor people. Let's try to regulate the sacraments. And also we did this. Is that the priests that were there were catering to the to the rich people. And the priest did not care too much for the for the poor people, and this saint said, "No, we got to go after. We have to help out the poor people." So Terebius himself he learned their language, so he could communicate with the Indians. He baptized many of them, and then he confirmed them. And he built hospitals for the sick. And established the first seminary so that the future priests would be well-formed, well-educated. This was actually the first seminary in the New World, in the Americas. With courage, he spoke out against the Spaniards who took advantage of the poor. So what happened was he was visiting a mission and he became very sick. He dragged himself into the church and asked to receive the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Then he died in that little mountain town. He left all his belongings to his servants and to the poor. So what we have here, my friends, in our Perseverance family, we have both Moses and this Spanish saint, 
St. Terribius of Mogroveco, who would be canonized in the year 1726, and he's a patron of Latin American bishops. That's right, he's a patron saint of Latin American bishops. So let's pray that all of us will become a modern Moses, a modern St. Terebius, to pray for our people. Many of our people are immersed in modern idolatry, no doubt about it. Let's not give in to despair, but let's lift up our hands and place these people on the altar in honor of Moses and St. Terebius, that they will be saved. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.